Hey, Shepherd family, this is John Carolis, one of our associate pastors, and it's been great to be walking with you in digital ministry over the last two years. You might have noticed that our digital ministry format, the services that we put out on Sunday mornings, look a lot like what an in-person worship service might uh, feel like and look like as you're sitting in a sanctuary anywhere really in the country. But we've also noticed that over the last two years, especially in the last six months or so, many people are getting back to in-person worship as part of their Sunday routine. So we're gonna be adjusting the feel and flow of these digital services in a way that hopefully is more accessible to those people who are looking to to take in some content from Shepherd as a complement to or in addition to their Sunday morning worship. So these services no longer will follow the, the typical flow of a worship service and instead will have three main parts. There will be a teaching section at the beginning that gives you a preview or even a reflection on what was shared on Sunday, a textual overview of what we'll be studying in person in our worship services. Then there will be a time of guided prayer to give you a devotional moment as well. And finally, it'll close with a few songs from our worship services in person. That way, if you're unable to make it to worship and you still want to have a moment of worship with your shepherd family, you can do so in this digital format. But if you are taking these offerings in as an addition or complement to your Sunday morning worship, hopefully this format goes along with your practice a little bit more naturally. Thanks for continuing to, to walk with us as we guide you in your spiritual formation, and we look forward to the months ahead. Over the next three months, myself, Pastor Scott, and Pastor Alan will be sharing with you a study on a cast of characters, that is, people who appear in the biblical narrative who give us a clearer picture of what our relationship with God is like. We're going to be looking at the prophet Isaiah and the role that he played in communicating to the people of Israel God's word. We're going to be hearing from the king, David, and his role of leadership as he he led the people of God in a relationship with him. And finally, we'll be hearing about a priest named Zadok. Zadok was an interceder for God's people and and him so that they could atone for their sins, so they could continue to be connected into the covenant that God has with his people. As we take a look over the next four weeks, though, at the prophet Isaiah, we need to be careful and set a few boundaries. In the first place, Isaiah is a long book of the Bible. It's one of the major prophets. There's 66 chapters in the book of Isaiah, and much of it is what seems to be abstract and open to interpretation poetry. The pictures that Isaiah paints seem to be filled with violence and judgment on one page, and then you turn the page and there's this beautiful picture of God's mercy. If you just try to wade into those waters alone or on your own and you haven't had much instruction or you don't have someone walking with you, it can be a rather confusing and and intimidating feat. And at the same time, we want to walk with you through these pages of Isaiah so that you can get to know who this prophet was, to hear his voice from his perspective, understand the role that he has between God's people and God's voice, what it means to share his message with the people that aren't really ready to hear it. So as we take four weeks to focus on who Isaiah was and how he spoke, and then looking at what the main tenets of his message were, the focus that he has on their disobedience, the focus that he has on the the city of Jerusalem, the city of Zion, the place of God's salvation, we're also going to spend our final week talking about how Jesus is the fulfillment of salvation for God's people through the prophecies of Isaiah. But before we get started, I want you to take take a moment and understand that Isaiah is someone with a special and unique role. He was called by God to deliver God's messages to his people, whether they were ready to hear it or not. These messages always communicated God's love for his people. But as you may know, love doesn't always feel like or look like or sound like love. There are times when a disobedient child needs a harsh word from his parent. There are times when in the course of a relationship, love expresses itself in a way that sounds negative or sounds too serious to be loving. But there's also these glimpses we have of the love of God that takes on a poetic and beautiful tone 
We see pictures of God's fulfillment of his salvation for his people in, in poems and in prophecies that are almost too beautiful to put into words, and yet God used Isaiah to do just that. As we spend time looking at the world through the, through the perspective of Isaiah, as we understand the relationship God had with his people 700 years before Jesus came onto the scene, we are going to understand a whole new aspect and perspective of the depth of our connection with God as his people. Even though his messages from the prophet Isaiah were from so long ago, their instruction and their insight bears much fruit for you and I, even today. There's a book in the, in the New Testament called Timothy, a letter from the great apostle Paul as he is instructing a young leader in the faith as to how to use the word of God. At that time, they didn't organize the Bible into an Old and New Testament because the New Testament hadn't been written yet. And so this verse that we're going to hear gives us a picture of how we should understand the use of God's word. And in doing so, we're going to know that the Apostle Paul is referring to the very same scriptures we are going to be spending time in over the next four weeks. 2 Timothy 3 says, All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. As the Apostle Paul is writing to his student, Timothy, someone who is taking on the role of church leader, someone who is going to be teaching people in the ways of the faith, he is making something very clear to this young Christian. He is making it clear that the word of God in its entirety, the prophets, the, the book that, that laid down God's law for his people, the collection of wisdom that we have in, in the writings of the great kings and wise people of, of the time before Jesus. All of that is useful for building up the body of Jesus, the people who believe in his message. In fact, he says, God uses it to prepare and equip his people for every good work. We believe in a God who changes us, who is constantly working on us, who helps us to see the areas that we need to rely on him more fully and pushes us and prods us and encourages us into a life that looks more like him. It looks more like his son, Jesus. Isaiah, even though he wasn't using the same language, had that very task. He was sent to God's people to give them his words, to give them his message. And sometimes because of the way that the people of Isaiah's day were living, that message took on a negative tone. He was speaking to a disobedient people. You see, at the time of Isaiah, God had established his nation. He had established his people in the Holy Land. They had been living there for some time and things were going pretty well for them. Even though that they had, the kingdom had split up, even though that there were different kings that sometimes were obedient or disobedient, the economy seemed to be strong. They, they, they had their own land. They were in a successful period of time. They were, in other words, confident and feeling good. There was high morale in Israel at that time. And sometimes with confidence and with high morale comes a sense of looseness, a sense of relaxing from the things that make us who we are. The same was true for them as they relaxed from God's covenant and began to forget the specific instructions that God had given them for how to live in the world. He had set them apart for his purposes, but they began to follow their own wandering hearts, they began to go their own ways instead of God's ways. And this disobedience took on some specific forms. In particular, especially in the book of Isaiah, we're going to hear a lot about the sin of idolatry. That is the sin of turning to other gods for your salvation, turning to other gods for the, the provision for your needs, turning to other gods for uh, good things in life or when you have a problem. This is one of the greatest sins that God's people ever committed because he had established them as his people. He had revealed himself to them through his servant Moses, through great signs and wonders, through establishing them in the Holy Land, a place to call their own. And through them, he was going to bring about a savior. But at this time of Isaiah, they had wandered away from him. They had forgotten that these great things had been done. They'd forgotten the ways in which God had revealed himself to them. And they were quick to turn the other way. So in the opening verses of Isaiah, we have a picture of what his project is all about. And understanding what his focus was over the course of a whole 66-chapter book helps us to understand the severity of some of the language 
but also the great relief and comfort offered in those glimpses of hope that we find in the book of Isaiah. From Isaiah chapter 1. These are the visions that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. He saw these visions during the years when Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah were kings of Judah. Listen, O heavens, pay attention, earth. This is what the Lord says. The children I raised and cared for have rebelled against me. In just two verses, we have an understanding of what Isaiah's project is really all about. You see, he lived at a time where we can trace back who was in charge when he was speaking. Who were the kings that were leading God's people at the time of Isaiah as the prophet, bringing God's word to his people? And what was his message all about? Verse 2 gives us that picture. The people I have raised and cared for have turned against me. God's message through Isaiah is calling his people to return to him. He's begging them to come back so that they might enjoy the relationship they have with their God rather than suffer the consequences of their mistakes, rather than suffer at the hands of the people around them, rather than suffer because they were turning to gods that couldn't answer their prayers. They were turning to fictional entities and and idols they would carve with their own hands. This great urgency and this great message would continue throughout the rest of the book. But today we're going to hear how the book of Isaiah is constructed so that we're not intimidated or worried about looking at this book and walking through it together. Instead, we'll become familiar with the way in which Isaiah speaks so that we can hear how he teaches God's people what they need to know. You see, the prophet Isaiah would bring people into a vision. He would paint them a picture of how things might be if they'd continue down a particular path. He would paint them a picture of how things were going to turn out according to what God had revealed to him. He would even sometimes make them stand almost at a crossroads, looking at what things may look like in the immediate future and how things are going to look in the far-reaching future. And he continued to remind his people that even though they were disobedient, Through suffering, they would return to their God. They would be reminded of their failings and throw themselves back into the Lord's merciful hands. And God would continue to keep his covenant with his people to bring about a savior for the entire world through them. We can see the fulfillment of this through the person of Jesus. But Isaiah and the people of of Israel at that time, they didn't have that same hindsight we do. And so we're going to have to work a little bit to imagine what it was like to hear these things for the first time. As you go through the book of Isaiah, there's a narrative that has three major pieces. There's a teaching about idolatry and reconciliation, what it means that God's people had turned away from him, but also how he was working to bring them back. And there's two ways in which he was going to exact that reconciliation and punishment at the same time. He was going to bring in the Assyrian Empire to, to siege and wage war with the people of Israel. And then after the Assyrians, the Babylonians would come into the scene. And throughout all this historical narrative, sometimes we lose the value and meaning behind this great picture. See, God's people would experience a great deal of suffering, but at the same time, they would also be brought back to God through these very same sufferings and experiences. God is amazing in the way that he uses hardship to bring about reconciliation and restoration. And those pieces of restoration that Isaiah gives to God's people are how we understand our relationship with God to continue to be even today. So as we spend time over the next three weeks after this one, looking at Isaiah's world, there's four pieces to our plan. This week, we talked a lot about Isaiah's world and language. We want to familiarize ourselves with who he is and how he works so that as we walk through his book over the next three weeks, we won't be uh, dealing with some of the, the challenges that exist there because we know how he talks. We know what the world he lives in looks like, and we understand how the relationship he has with God is characterized. Then we'll be talking specifically about his message on idolatry and disobedience. We'll be looking at some of those passages that give heed to the way in which God experienced their disobedience, the way that it hurt him, the way that it hurt his heart, and also the way that it led God's people further away. And yet, even in the midst of that disobedience, he was calling them to return to him, offering them his mercy if they would turn away from their wicked ways. After that, we'll be spending some time looking at the prominence of the picture of Zion as the place of God's salvation. What does it mean that all nations will be brought back and turned to God through Jerusalem, through God's holy city, Zion? What does it mean that that will be the place, the connection, the intersection of 
all people across the world in their relationship and reconciliation to God? How would God reconnect to his people that were scattered all over the world through that particular place? And finally, we'll be looking at how Jesus himself is the fulfillment of those messianic promises. How Jesus is the one that fulfilled God's promises through Isaiah to bring about a reconnection to God's people. I'm excited to be taking this walk with you through the book of Isaiah, and I hope you stick with us as we also take a look at David and Zadok over the next few weeks. Hey, Shepherd family, this is Pastor Scott Seidler, and welcome to our spring ministry season here at Shepherd. Especially if you are new to our Shepherd family, if you are a winter guest finally returning to our Shepherd family, or just coming to us for the first time, a really special welcome to you. It is a great time to be at Shepherd because our Shepherd congregation has come roaring out of this COVID malaise we've been in for really far too long. We had last year in 2022, almost 40 baptisms here at Shepherd. And for a congregation worshiping around 350 every weekend, 10% of our congregation being grown by baptizing, that's pretty incredible. We've had about another 50 new members that have affiliated with our congregation. And as we go into 2023, we already have over 20 baptisms on the schedule coming down the pipeline here in these first four months and over 100 new members that have indicated a desire to affiliate, to formally connect with our Shepherd family. Can I just stop and say, Happy New Year, Shepherd. And thanks be to God for his faithfulness, not only in what the staff and ministry leadership is doing, but more importantly, what our Shepherd family members are doing. The folks like yourself that are in the pews Sunday after Sunday and sharing the good news of what God has done through Jesus Christ and the good news of what God is doing here at Shepherd of the Desert Scottsdale. Because of the newfound volume of folks that are affiliating with Shepherd, we're going to be introducing a new method or process of membership, and it's called the Discover Series. Three gatherings on the fourth Sunday of every month here on our Shea campus, beginning at 11 o'clock, ending at 1215, with childcare for those of you who may need it. These Discover gatherings are opportunities to explore the faith of Shepherd, the discipleship process that Shepherd celebrates and uses in our congregation's ministry, and then finally, the nuts and bolts of our organization, the way in which we govern ourselves, we receive and spend money, the way we behave as a 501c3 nonprofit organization in the state of Arizona. All of those things are important for you to know and understand at a sufficient level in order to be a real integral part of our Shepherd family. And then on the fourth Sunday of April, we're going to receive our new members. We're going to celebrate a special set of services for baptisms of new members, infants and adults. We really look forward to what this spring semester offers us in terms of new pathways for making sure we're receiving new members with hospitality, integrity, and clarity of purpose. That's what we're about. So, hey, uh, on the bottom of the screen, you'll find some connection uh, links for going on our website, registering for these Discover gatherings. Again, the fourth Sunday of every month here on our Shea campus in Scottsdale, beginning at 11 o'clock with childcare, ending by 1215, light snacks, coffee, water, juice, that kind of thing. Love for you to be here. Uh, Pastor Allen and Pastor John will be leading the first, uh, first gathering on uh, the fourth Sunday of January and uh, look forward to learning from them the nuts and bolts of our Christian faith and especially what we highlight here at Shepherd. Over and against maybe other congregations, denominational and non-denominational, what we highlight as a church. And then I'll be leading the second two in February and March. I look forward to seeing you there. Make sure you go and register. Let us know if you need childcare. If you've got any questions, please call one of the pastors. Please call the church office at this number right there or this email address right there and we'll be happy to get back in touch with you. Thanks again. Look forward to seeing you. God's doing great things here at Shepherd as we all endeavor to lead people to follow Jesus.